I'm pleased to welcome Kavi Pajara onto the couch here at the foundation. He currently has an exhibition with us called The Golden Mile, which is uh, about the Gujarati community around that uh, famous street in Leicester. Uh, but tell us, Kavi, how did you end up living in, in uh, Leicester in the first place? I was, I was born in Leicester in the early 70s. My parents came to uh, the UK after uh, the African countries of, like Uganda and Kenya gained independence and, um, and placed restrictions on, the, on, on residency of non-nationals. They were, look, they were uh, pursuing Africanization policies. And so ha holding British passports, they came to the UK. My, um, first, my mum and dad came from Kenya in 69 and then followed by my mother's side of the family in 72 after Idi Amin was a bit harder um, um, expulsion of Ugandan Asians. They get, were given 90 days to come. So they were, country. in effect, refugees? They were, yes, they were. Exactly. And why did they choose Leicester? There was, um, well, interestingly, Leicester at the time, after the first wave that came here from Kenya, when after, and during that 90 days of the Ugandan expulsion, Leicester City Council put adverts up in the East African press dissuading Asians to come to Leicester, saying there's citing reasons like there's... Uh, lack of jobs, lack of housing, lack of educational opportunities, a strain on public services. Very similar to the, um, the argument that was placed for Brexit in 2016. Yeah. So how was your childhood growing up in Leicester? It was generally a happy childhood. My parents are, you know, a stable house, stable family life. My mum and dad um, gave me a lot of love, but it was a time when there was a lot of racism around. Um, I remember some of my earliest memories going back to school at primary school there was a sport called packy bashing when old packs of older kids would wait opposite the school gates encouraging their tough younger siblings to essentially chase down brown kids and beat them up literally beat them up literally so you would well have... they would you know there was I'd walk away the worst of times with cut lip or a, a booting in um, but I did have this amazing lollipop lady, Laura, who I've met many years later when I moved back to Leicester, who would protect me from from these uh, National Front skinheads if if I could get to her. And it was a 10 minute sprint to get to her. But if I could get to her, she always... Uh, and then she me. saw you across the road and into your Yes, house. and then got me home. But I didn't always make it. And then on the days I didn't, it was pretty tough. But that was a normal, normal state of affairs for most Asian kids growing up at that time. We normalised this kind of racial abuse and it felt like a when we went out, even going around the Golden Mile, um, you were always aware as a child that, um, you know, there's this risk. And your your senses were alert to that and on the lookout for any possibilities of... And did of this trouble. go on e even in your teenage years? So by the time you were 17, 18, or no, had it, had it uh, calmed had, down by It then? had calmed down by then. But then there's always just you can sense something, you know, in the way someone offers you help or doesn't offer you help or the way someone addresses you. There was... it it be, it become more kind of less obvious but it was still there um, but it more than that I think by the time I was a teenager it affected me somehow you and know? is this what made you think about moving to London which is what you did I guess when you were 18 or so yeah I, I moved yeah I moved I moved to I went to university and went off to um, study computer science at university but it, it affected me by that stage and I wanted to get out of there <sighs> This is an admission in a way that I'd, and it's something I've only processed much later, is that because of I'd, I'd had all of that racial abuse, I somehow um, blame, immaturely at age 18, blamed all of that abuse on my in Indian heritage. I think it's kind of common for people to go through that. So I'd, I'd wanted to get out of Leicester look for something new, look for something that was other. 
And it wasn't until much later, when I was mature and I thought about these experiences, that I realised actually, you know, it wasn't my heritage that was to blame. It was, um, you know, racists, essentially. And um, I, I've, when I came back, I came back knowing the, 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 the what my cultural heritage and the, the power that, that I'd given my own life. And I was able to then come back and, and be proud of that heritage and, and work on a project that might... Um, so I guess it was in, in the time you were down in London that you came across photography. Tell us how you first encountered the I medium. actually it was in Leicester when I was like a, a teenager. I was probably about 12 or 13. And there was um, Reverend Martin who lived a few doors down from me. My dad had a news agent, so I would be always looking at photography magazines and Melody. I'd read everything from Melody Makes to Enemy and all the photography magazines. And Reverend Martin came into the shop one day and was um, saw that I was into photography, or at least reading about it. And his son was doing a photography workshop. Uh, over the summer and invited me to join his son in that and he persuaded talked to my dad into into go into allowing me to go which I did and then I, a whole world of photography opened up to me and I was so from that point I, I owe that moment so much in terms of my love of photography and I and it stayed with me right through my life up until now but I always kept it in the background really and then when you came back uh, with your family your young family yeah. to Leicester uh, I mean, did you know then that you wanted to do this project around the Golden Mile? Uh, was that the thing that sent you back or was it just a happy coincidence when you got there and you realised the potential of the project? Yeah, I knew I wanted to do a project. Up until that point, you know, photography was just a leisure act. It was something I did for my for the joy, sheer joy of it, really. Always single images. I wanted to do a project. I didn't know what that project was. And that moment of coming back to Leicester, relocating with my family. And the reason for us to moving back to Leicester, we, were being, we, had a, we lived in a very small flat in London. We wanted more space, so we relocated. We got priced out of London, essentially. And so we moved back. And um, during that, over that two weeks, two weeks after moving back, the Brexit vote happened and the result came out and um, and it was that moment of both the personal and the political um, happening at the same time. I thought I want I really felt the need to respond to that somehow and I thought okay that's going to be my project. Also I wanted to redefine the city for myself. I'd come back to this to the city and I was showing my kids around around Leicester and I was going oh that's you know that's the wall where I had my nose broken or that's the bus stop where such and such happened and I didn't realize it until I'd moved back really how much of these experiences I'd suppressed in my in my subconscious somehow um, and showing my children around I really felt like Brexit had brought this moment where I felt we were slipping back to that somehow. We were suddenly in, I work in the news, and in the news you, I was seeing everyone, um, there was an element of Brexit where people were allowed to voice their prejudices openly against migration, and the mm. country was pivoting towards this um, anti-immigrant populism and I really wanted a project I wanted to to redefine the city in in the way I saw it today that it wasn't this place that it was when I was growing up in the 70s that it was um, that this experiment in multiculturalism had worked um, and I thought I can do that by documenting a community that perhaps some of those Brexit voters might find un-British, but for me, are very British. Okay, so you have the motivation. That's always yes. a good start. <laughs> How did you go about taking these photographs? Well, I, I, there's a lot of missteps <clears throat> to start with. I, I, start, I had kind of had this street photography mentality to begin with. I was just taking moments and... I work as an editor. I'm in a room by myself um, for most of that time. I was kind of, I was in, I am quite introverted and shy. So I kept my distance from people, took lots of snatched moments on the street. And, and I did that for about a year. I'd drive over to the area, walk around 
I did that for a year. And one day I came back to my car and found two police officers waiting for me. Somebody had called the police and I was clearly, I, people felt I was acting suspiciously. And from that point, I really thought, okay, something has to change. I have to change the way I'm working. Um, and so I changed up my equipment. I got a larger, I changed larger format on a tripod, being really obvious. And from that point, everything changed. I was, um, people were coming up to me and talking to me out of, asking me out of curiosity rather than suspicion what I was doing. Um, and it was a small step then from um, just saying, hey, would you like to be in the photograph? And so I could slowly overcome these, uh, my nervousness about approaching people. Also, um, um, because I was listening now to people's stories and talking to them, I was listening just as much as I was looking. So I was making these connections to people that really um, gave me this, um, it made me part of the community in many ways. Um, and there was a real, there was a real bond developing over that time. I've been reading about um, the philosophy behind love. This is a bit of an aside here, but the philosophy of love at the moment. And when you fall in love, you, um, a part of you um, dies so that you can enable something, a new, a new you can emerge, a new you that's entangled with another another person or, or, or something. And I really felt that was, now reflecting on the project, I really felt that that was happening to me because I was, I was kind of in love with this community again. I was, when you're in love, you're more courageous. And I was being more courageous. When you're in love, you're, you feel things deeply. And I was feeling those things for the community as well. And then we came across you when you applied for one of our bursaries yeah. and uh, we immediately, uh, you know, liked the work and you came down, we had some discussions. Did that have any impact on your way of working? Enormous. It was an enormous impact. One, it was up until that point, I'd shown the work to very few people. I had like, you know, my friends and family following me and looking at the work on Instagram and commenting but no one really outside of that and I, I'd sent it out to a few photographers during lockdown because the bursary was during lockdown and they encouraged me saying oh this works good you should you know you should keep going and so that gave me the confidence to show it to to apply for your bursary to apply for a competition at, with um, the British Journal of Photography and both of those happened at the same time and then but your bursary Martin what was it wasn't the money really, it was that little line at the bottom saying Martin Parr will, you know, is open to some mentorship. And I thought, that's the gold. <laughs> and I, I remember just getting that going, ah, this is my opportunity. I've got, um, I got straight in my car, I think I was down here within a few weeks of getting that. That's right. And it's been a real pleasure to work with you oh, and see the work you. develop. And now we have a book in the next exhibition. How was it for you trying to put the book together? Was it a difficult exercise? It was one of the most rewarding parts of the process. I kind of fell in love with photography all over again. And this is my first project, as you know. Um, so work, I thought I could bring some of, because I'm an editor and I've also done some screenwriting in the past. I thought I might be able to bring some of those skills to it. Because it's all storytelling, right? Um, but I had this working relationship with um, Tom Booth Woodger, who works, who's um, produced books for Satanta, has edited many books. And our relation, it was a deeply collaborative relationship where he would give me enough space to, to, um, to try out. I didn't want to just hand the project over for an editor to put everything together for me. I wanted to have a go. And so he gave me the space to have a go, really. And I think once we had those first few sequences together, um, we'd bring it to you much when we when we were about 40 images, we brought it to you to have a look. You encouraged us to look at images that perhaps we'd overlooked or not considered. You asked us to reconsider those images, which was 
amazing to have your input into that and I I can feel your presence in that edit and and some of the decisions and your in your 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 help guidance and, and gent very gently shepherding us through through that process. Good mm. to hear. Thank you, Gabby. <laughs> And now, of course, I mean, one thing that's important is you're, you've got this opportunity to take the show to Leicester, yeah. back to the community. Yeah. And I guess you've been giving people prints as you've gone along. Have they enjoyed them? Have they uh, responded well? Yeah, it was such a crucial part of when making the work. We'd give, I'd give prints back to everybody I collaborated on a portrait with. And we stopped shooting in April this year. By that time, after so it had been five years of shooting, by that time I could practically knock on any door in the community, and, or any random door, and the person opening the door would already know about the project. And they would be like, come in, you know, my, my daughter showed me your photographs on Instagram and so-and-so down the road had given, you'd given them a print, and they wanted to be part of the project. So those 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 prints were so crucial for me to feel confident that the community were happy about the way they were being represented which is really important i do, wouldn't want them to be um you know not be happy about the way the way things are but the show will go to less museum yes. i guess they can get there rather than a community yeah, center yes exactly it's going to be in a in a less in a beautiful um, victorian room and we're just planning that at the moment will be middle of next year Okay, so what's next? I mean, it's always with someone who has a very successful first project, that second project's always a bit tricky. Have you got anything up your sleeve yet? There are, there, yeah, I've got a few. I, I don't know if I can talk about them now, just because uh, the magic bursts, I'll burst the bubble for myself. So I'll um, just keep that going for as long as I can. That's yeah. probably a wise move, yeah. but whatever it is, uh, Cabby, we're going to look forward to seeing oh, it. Thank, thank you so much for the discussion. Thank you, Martin. I really appreciate it.